everyone. I'm Lori Nelson. I'm the uh, executive director of She Heroes, and we want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking with Esther Hare. Esther is the senior director at the Worldwide Developer of Marketing at Apple. So this should be a lot of fun. But first of all, I'm going to turn things over to our board chair, Sophia Yen. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Sophia Yen with the new Dr. Jill Biden. We all must now claim our titles. So everybody that has a title, please feel free to claim your title, be it PhD, MD, JD, MBA, Masters, MPH, everything. So feel free to claim either on your listing or when you speak or in the chats. Um, please, everybody, open up your chat ask any questions that you have along the way and we'll ask them of Esther at the end or depending she can tell us what her preference is. Um, give you a little background about She Heroes for those of you who are new to us. Um, she Heroes was founded by three MIT alumna which means all women and um, the idea was just if you google female um, computer scientist marketing up will pop Esther Hare and talking about how excited and fun it is to do her job and to inspire the future people to follow in her footsteps. Um, we are really excited to have all of you here. Uh, the target audience is third to eighth graders, though certainly older and younger are welcome. And we hope that you will watch these videos that we have online. So go to our website, attend these wonderful um, Zoom meetings that we're having monthly and tell your teachers about it, particularly on a rainy day, this is a perfect video to watch and do instead of Curious George, etc. Certainly Curious George is fun, but we want to open the minds of young people that women can be whatever we want to be as long as we work hard towards it. And that for those without uteruses, they can envision us as their CEO, as their coworker, as their manager, and at the very least as their equal. So um, I want to welcome all of you and um, please all the parents on here, feel free to donate or volunteer to sheheroes.org so we can continue our work. And I'll let Lori, our amazing executive director, take it from here. But I do want to acknowledge um, our board members, Dr. Michelle Kraus, PhD, um, Politico, but also working on COVID companies and just an amazing woman on as well as Amanda Guo, CPA, who has volunteered her time and efforts to make sure our finances are in order and is so giving of her time. And then Emily Wu, um, our other board member who has a, I think she has an MBA as well. And uh, she is great at development work. So thanks for all, all of you. And I know all of you are just very excited to be talking to someone who's living in the heart of Silicon Valley where it's all going on in technology. So Esther, we'd like to introduce you now. Well, hi. <laughs> hi there. So how are you doing today? <laughs> I am good. And I just want to say thank you to, to all of you for joining. I think this is such a, a great use of a Sunday afternoon. Um, and it's really, it's really great to see that um, whether it's your parents forcing you or you're actually interested, um, but doing something slightly educational and just trying to meet other women that are like you. Um, it's, it's really inspiring to me that you're all joining and spending this time, even if it's just for an hour, just to, to hear somebody new and hear a different perspective. So I just want to say hi to you. So Esther, we'd like to start at the beginning. What were you like as a little girl? How did you, uh, what were the things that got you excited or passionate about life or where you were going? <laughs> Well, I think it's, what's interesting is I was not, as a girl, I was very different to how I am as a, as a young lady and as an older lady. <laughs> um, I really was very shy as a child, didn't have the happiest, most fun childhood. Um, and so what was interesting to me is the things that spoke to me were the things that made sense. And when a lot of other things didn't, um, I think I gravitated towards things that were logical. When I think back on it at the time, of course, that's not how I probably perceived it. But, um, you know, just in looking at the subjects that I liked as a child, I liked math, it made sense. I wasn't so great at some of the other stuff. Um, I wasn't really good, great at regurgitating facts, but when it came to like applying things and, and knowing, you know, how, things in theory, I think. Um, that was kind of my forte. And so I just sort of graduated slowly more to the sciences. It wasn't really a conscious decision as a child that 
I'm going to be this great um, leader, or I'm going to be this great technology person. It was really more of like really listening to what was interesting to me. And so the way it works in England is you actually select, it's a very different system. And it's, I think the American system is, 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 is much better in a lot of ways because it's a lot broader. Um, but the way that it works is you select nine subjects that you do for O level. Um, and then out of those nine and O levels you do when you're 16. And out of those nine, then you select three or four that you do at A-level, and that's what you complete at 18, which is when you graduate high school here and go to university. Well, I was a year ahead of my class. So I was picking at 13 and a half, I'm picking nine subjects, and at 15 and a half, I'm picking three subjects. And so it was very, um, sort of my life just kind of happened to me. Um, and I was picking from, from a perspective of what made sense in my mind, what was I the best at, and what was I you know, logically drawn to. And so at A level, I did math, physics, and computer science. Mm -hmm. And at that level, they were logical and fun. But then it came to uh, university and what, what am I want to do at university? And so then I was really picking out of those three subjects. And so I certainly wasn't going to do math or physics because at that stage, they were getting a little less logical. And so I, I, I sort of fell into, I don't, I mean, it was my choice, but I sort of just fell into computer science. And it was almost a shock to me when I started my degree, because I went to an all girls boarding school. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with the sense that, and I'm not specifically saying all girls or all boys schools are better for that gender, but I grew up with the sense of if there was a position open, whether it was pet shop or a tuck shop or uh, you know, head girl or in charge of any of the teams or debate, it was always a girl. And so it was the gender conversation was out of it. And so when I came to university and all of a sudden there were these boys and the few girls that were in computer science didn't speak and were shy and took the backstage. It was a bit of a shock to me, honestly. And I think that's where the leadership role started to play is because I would be like, come on girls, like put your hand up, like speak, you know? And so it's that sort of boldness from being in a girl's school. Where they're right. <laughs> exactly. And so I think that's sort of really what the genesis was for getting into the role that I had, you know, the, the degree that I took, but also sort of where the leadership part came from was sort of like the stubbornness of like, come on girls, like let's represent here. <laughs> <laughs> well, was it a computer science major? Was that a daunting thing? I mean, it, you were, it was such a rare thing for a woman at the time, but, but how did you manage, I mean, both being surrounded by boys, but also this, you know, rather uh, stringent sort of training in, in ac academic computer. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it was an easy degree by a long shot, but it, it was logical to me. And so it wasn't necessarily easy. It wasn't the most difficult thing I've ever done. It was, it, it felt right. You know, it felt like this is the right thing to be doing at the time. And, and you had no idea at the time that all of this world would exist. Well, no, right. It was, it was sort of new and it was exciting. And the university I went to was, you know, University of Kent in Canterbury in England. I grew up really interesting because right then everyone, the, they were the place that sort of developed wide area networks and networking was just a thing. And, you know, the fact that you could go on the Unix system and see if somebody else was online was like, so, you know, it was just an exciting time, right? It felt, it felt cool. Right. And, and, and it felt, it felt fun. So, so then when you got out of uh, college, what, were you planning to go directly into a computer science type of career or were you looking at other options too? No, I mean, I think coming out, you know, you're very much, um, it's what you know, right? It's like, okay, this is what I know. I have my degree and this is what I should go do. And so, you know, I think the interesting part is, and, and probably for some of the, the younger girls listening is, you know, there's, there's sort of this perception that you get your degree and, and then you're stuck. You're in this role where, okay, now I have to be a coder for the rest of my life. And, and that's just not the case. I definitely, when I came out of my degree, I, my first two jobs were in programming and I could do it, but my heart wasn't in it. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is the parts of me that were missing were the leadership part, and the community part. Coding was very much a part of, you know, you versus the computer, no matter how logical it was. I, I wanted more interaction, more, you know, other people. It seemed like other people were having fun and I was stuck with my computer. <laughs> they were doing meetings and wasn't up and, you know, creating stuff. And so it was interesting because 
the, the next job that I did after the coding jobs that I had originally was I went into market analysis, which at the time was big data, would now not be considered big data by any sh shot of the imagination, but at the time was big data and market analysis. And what I realized was it made sense to me because it was logical, breaking down all these huge spreadsheets into, you know, into logical data and numbers that made sense. But the joy for me was in the presenting the data, the, you know, making numbers look pretty and have tell a good story, not just a graph, but really what is that story telling us and what's the part behind it? What's well, and I think, that, I think probably some of our young people would want to know what is big data and market analysis? In other words, how, what, what are we talking about the, as, a, as a kind of a job? What is that? Right. Mean? So it was sort of a jigsaw. So big data is basically, you know, you've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of data for whatever reason, whatever you're looking at trying to decide, you know, what is this data showing you, whether that's sales numbers or, um, so let's just say it's sales. And then you're looking at, okay, let's look at the trends. What is this data telling us? Are we doing better in China over time? Are we doing better in certain regions in China over time? Are we doing better in Europe? You know, so you're looking at lots and lots of data. It's not like the 10 lines that you might see in a school project where you're like, it's obvious. This is, you've really got to do a lot of analysis. Hmm. And this is stuff that you couldn't do by yourself, that you need a computer to be able to help you to do that, right? You've got 100,000 uh, pieces of data. You need a computer to be able to look at that data and say, these are the trends. And, and on a smaller scale, maybe you've done something in school, like with an Excel spreadsheet, where you've taken it, and I'm not sure some of you, that might be a bit above you, but um, you've looked at Excel spreadsheet and you've said, okay, I've got 200 lines here and I'm going to run a pivot table and it's going to tell me how many, of, how many are yellow, how many are red, how many are blue. That's what basically what big data is. It's taking lots of very complex things that a person couldn't do and asking a computer to give you that data back in a way that makes more sense. So was this a kind of intro into the world of marketing? Yeah. And, and what happened was I started seeing how much fun it was to take these very complex data types of things and run scripts on them and do the computer science interface part of it, but then also see the results. And then the joy was when I realized I loved the, the presenting, the thinking through data, the making the slides look pretty. And I loved actually presenting the data that I could talk to. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I was the one that created it. I was the one that thought through it, that knew what it meant. And so when I got the chance then to stand in front of the directors at the time and to say, and to stand up for my own work, I realized that was the thing I liked. Like I liked that part <laughs> and I ended up doing more of that part. And because you like something in general, if you're really interested in something, you're going to do better at it, right? You're genuinely interested in doing it. And so that's why I think it's really important when you're at the early age and you're really thinking about, you know, your life in, in perpetuity seems like such a huge thing for you to have to choose. But I think <laughs> what you really want to be doing is thinking not what is cool, not what are people expecting of me, but really like inwardly, what are the things that are interesting to me? And what are the things that really make my heart sing? Because it's not going to be like anybody else. You know, it's really going to be a personal thing. And, you know, you, we need writers in the world. We need computer scientists. There's lots of different, there's lots of different technology roles, right? We, if you open any kind of documentation, there's technical writers who are writing. These are people who are passionate about writing things really clearly because they understand the technology, right? So these are smart technologists who are also writers. A lot of the marketing folks are smart technologists who are thinking about things from a marketing perspective. Mm -hmm. you know, so there are so many roles in technology. It's not just coding, but having, you know, of course, this is what I'm going to propose, but, but, <laughs> but having a coding background, having some knowledge of coding is so important because then you can feel like you have the same equal footing as people. You can understand what some of those roles might be. You can understand what some of the possibilities might be with you know, understanding what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accomplish. Well, on that note, can you talk about how computer science integrates with other career directions, but how it might be a fundamental piece of it or compelling part to a journey that is elsewhere, but uses this? Yeah, and I think, you know, Steve Jobs used to say, you know, it's like the next language and it's a universal language. So it's really thinking about 
this is a way that we can all speak to each other that's that's universal that can help we can all understand the same the same principles and if if we all have this as at a very very basic level if we all understand what the even if you just understand conceptually what the components of coding are what, what's able what's available to you then you can understand a whole world opens up of some of the problems that you might be able to solve mm -hmm. and so you know i like a, a quote from ratatouille and uh, my old vp used to say used to quote this quote from ratatouille which is everyone can cook but not everyone should be a chef <laughs> and that's kind of the idea right it's it's that you know, we can all have a basic understanding of things and I can make, you know, eggs on toast and, and think I did a great job and my husband will look and say, okay, what's for dinner? <laughs> you know, cooking is not my forte as anyone who knows me will know. Um, so, that, so that's sort of the idea is that you have this baseline and then you can take it anywhere. And I think one of the things, certainly for the, the next generation is, you know, when I went through it, it was so new that really there was, it wasn't really a gendered thing. I mean, obviously it was because there weren't very many women who did computer science, but it wasn't quite as nerdy or um, as it is now. And I think, you know, understanding that it's computer science is for everybody. It shouldn't be dorky or nerdy or cool or fun. It should just be another thing like history and geography. Are you interested in it? Does it, does it make your heart sing? Does it help you? Does it seem logical to you? And if it does, you should really think about how it can help you because it's in so many of the things that we do, you know, on a daily basis, you've got, you know, anything you look at, any, you know, any, you're using Zoom, right? Somebody had to sit down and really figure out how does that work and how does the, what does the networking piece look like behind that? And how are we going to get all these people on the same thing at the same time? I mean, there's so many things. I was just reading literally right before we got on this call, um, an article about a lady who's in artificial intelligence and uh, Ellen Hildebrand, I think was her name, and Hildebrand, I'll have to look. But what she, the article was about was she would, and her husband were the ones that defined the, mo the model for looking at images, in, looking at images and figuring out where the outlines were. Like, you know, when you do these great fun Snapchat filters and you can change the background or in Zoom, you can change the background. Well, her work was really about figuring out when you're looking at a, at a complex image, like for example, talking to you, Laura, your hair, like how do you know which one is one hair, and which one is, you know, and what's the background of the picture? Is there a line in the picture? Is that the one hair sticking up? And it's so interesting. And if you start looking at technology in that way about what's so interesting about it, it just, your mind starts to blow and you start to really get into how fun it is. Like there is some problems that are just so fun to solve. Well, I love what you said about how it's a new language and a universal language. I think that is so compelling because that is like a, a, an absolutely essential tool for navigating in the world, I would think. And yeah. I know there are so many girls groups, you know, girls who code and all these yeah. other activities. One of the events that I went to, a STEAM Symposium, they were marketing uh, play toys for uh, four-year-olds that were giving yeah. them spatial concepts of how to code. And I think that that but probably, I, maybe you can speak to this, this is sort of the direction that we're moving in with uh, everyone really becoming up to speed on things like that. Yeah, and I think, you know, for the parents that are on, on the call, I think, you know, one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing Apple is really thinking through how to make curriculum and how to make coding fun. Mm -hmm. And so Swift Playgrounds is a free app that's on the App Store um, that anybody can download for free um, and really take coding from the beginning. And one of the things that really the teams did such an amazing job of is making it non-gendered, right? It's really, it's not all about making robots and it's not all about making dolls. It's not trying to specifically, it's about making it fun and making it intuitive and engaging. And so you know, one of the things that, that we do a lot and, you know, some of the folks on, on my team and, and some of the, the teams that I work really closely with, we run a, a scholarship program for kids. Um, and, and this is to come to our developer conference. And we ask them to create their own Swift playground that we can experience and see within a few minutes, we can open it and see. And we have so much fun. We open these playgrounds and we fun. We, we play with the, the stuff that, that these other students are creating. And so... Uh, for those of you who are parents, really, um, I would encourage you to, to download Swift Playgrounds uh, from the App Store and just do the first, do the very first exercise. That's it. Because once you do one, you're like, oh, this is fun. This is easy. And there's this preconceived sort of idea that it's, oh, it's so complicated, which 
sure by the time you're you know you're feely and you're doing you know machine learning yes it's complicated but at, at a base level everyone can understand and i think once you get over that hump it's just starting right it's like anything else like any big project like uh uh, put it off, put it off, but just break it down into small parts and start one of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I've just encouraged that. And and so you'd encourage girls to learn coding? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's only so that when the boys think that they know what they're doing, you can tell them that, no, I hired you this one ages ago. This one was an easy one. Let me tell you, let me help you. Do you want me to help you? Well, you know, there's a lot of focus these days on what they call the STEM gap, which is that boys are more likely to be much more interested in STEM career paths and STEM activities altogether, whereas mm -hmm. girls have a bit of a, you know, general sort of resistance. They're not that interested. Can you talk about that? I mean, do you see that out in your world as you go about doing your business? I do. And um, what's interesting to me and... and I didn't really share this at the beginning, but I'm also executive sponsor of Women at Apple. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking about girls in computing and bringing girls in and really growing the, the, the community of women in computer science and, and how important that is. And, you know, the data, you know, sort of mortifying, but it really, the data shows that women and girls, girls' self-confidence peaks at nine years old. And that to me is horrifying. After nine years old, self-confidence drops like a rock. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's so crucial that this happens early, which is why I love seeing all these young faces, because that's when it matters. If you're 14 and 15, sure, you can still do it. If you're 75, you can start today. But, but how great to start early. And I think part of that self-confidence and part of that drop and that gender gap, which is exactly where it starts, is because society genders things. If you go to pick a place, you go to Target and you go to the little boy section, it's rockets and robots and goodness knows what, and you go to the little girl section and it's unicorns and rainbows and, and flowers. And that's all great, but what if you're a little boy that loves unicorns or a little girl loves robots? Like, you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be putting agenda on specific topics and specific thoughts and ideas. And I know that can be a little bit far reaching for some people, but I really believe that that's, that's where it starts. And that's why it's so important that we have computer science in schools, mm. because it should be computer science at whatever level should be presented to you at the same time as English and math and physics and, and all of these other things. And then you can decide, is this something I like? Is this something that's interesting to me or not? It shouldn't be something that you have to then decide after school is this a club I want to join and is this the cool club or is this not the cool club and is chess cooler than computer science or is computer science cooler than you know hip-hop you know it's like you really you know we've got to make it to be part of school so that every kid has a chance to be exposed and every kid has a chance to realize if it's important for them and if it, if it appeals to them and honestly to see if they're good at it mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting how many people are, um, are surprised by how good they are at it like, well, I never thought I'd be good at this, but I took this one informatics class. I mentor a lot of kids, and, and two of the girls that I mentor right now are part of the Historically Black Colleges and Universities mentor program that we run at Apple. And both of them said they took a side class, and then they got interested in it. So they were doing, one of them was doing an English degree and took an informatics class and loved it and changed degrees. So it's just because she wasn't exposed to it before. And so that's why it's where we do a lot of work to make sure that we have, that we're doing folks, stuff that's focused for kids and that we get kids involved early. Well, and on a side note, I, one of the women that we uh, that did a She Hero video, a video of is a mathematician. And, and that always strikes me as a very unusual career path to choose. And she explained that her interest in it started when she was a child because she was loved puzzles and problem solving and and puzzles were her entree into math. If there's an entree into a world of computer science, what might it be? A more interest in just science altogether or? No, I think, you know, it's sort of how I started about how, how I saw it when I was a child. I think it's because it's logical, right? And, it, and what I think is really interesting is how much it appeals to everything in life, right? So if you have a computer science, you're, you're, okay, here's your task. Your job as a, as a coder, as a programmer, is to take that task and break it down into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller components until you figure out the most basic, if this happens, then this happens, else this happens, right? The most basic if-then-else statement. 
that's what you're breaking these massive complex problems down into these really small steps. And so you can apply that to anything. Given a huge task at, at school to write a paper about whatever, the first thing to do is figure out, okay, well, what, are, what am I trying to write? What are the, how, how many chapters do I want? What should I be breaking this into? Is there a start, is there a middle, is there an end? What's the conclusion? So it just helps you break down anything and in that way it's logical. So to me, logic equals computer science. Mm -hmm. If you want to, if you can logically think through a problem and if that, you know, it's, it is sort of a puzzle, right? And sometimes it, it's not obvious, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's, that's the joy. There are a lot of jobs where there isn't an end result, right? Mm -hmm. This is a job where you might be frustrated as can be, just the same way you are sometimes with homework. You know, it's like, oh, this doesn't make any sense. And then you get it, and it's the getting it that gives you the joy, right? And then you're like, I got it. And then you can't wait to show your friends how to do it because you, it makes sense to you. And I feel like it's very much the same idea. It's like, it gives you a sense of, I was able to, to take this challenge. So if you don't like challenges, you might not like it, but. <laughs> I love what you just said, I, and I do think that's so important, you know, it's really, um, you know, trying to uh, uh, assess somebody's interest and passion and how that can really unfold into a lifetime pursuit of a, of a career. Yeah. And I, I love what you say about logic. If you have a logical mind, then this is the go going to be the kind of thing that would appeal to you. Well, back to some other things here. We've got a few questions coming in. And one of them from Lucia is, how many years did you spend in college? I spent four years in college. So <laughs> my degree was computer science. So I did a, a, a three-year computer science degree, but I took a year out in the middle. Um, and I went to the University paris sud -Ons in France, in Paris, and I got a, a licence, which is basically the same degree, but in French. I finished it in French first, and then I came back and got it in English. Oh. Um, so four years. <laughs> uh, and then from Judy Wong, were you ever in a situation where you felt you were treated differently because you are a woman? And how did you handle that situation? I mean, of course, and I think we all know that that's the case, right? I mean, you're living in a under a rock if you don't think you get treated differently. But I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, when people always ask you this, what, what do you think, what would you tell your younger self? Is that confidence? Because when I was younger and earlier in my career and I did get treated differently, I was too shy, nervous. Um, I can't think of the right words to say, but I didn't speak up. I didn't speak for myself. I didn't say this is not an okay way to talk. I didn't um, I didn't think, um, I didn't think to say, wait a minute, what, what are you talking about? You know, and I also, at a different level, thought that the way to succeed was to act like a man. And so that if they did it, I should do it. If they were crass, I should be crass. And there was definitely a, a time of my life where I became a different person because I was trying to be somebody I wasn't. And I think as you get older, then you start to realize, and as you become a parent, you start to realize, and you get your own confidence, like, oh, that's, you know, that's not it at all. Um, and as far as how I handle it, I think, I mean, probably not well sometimes, um, but the best ways I handle it um, was, you know, there's this saying in, um, in Scotland that my dad will say all the time, which is, ever a true word said in jest. And it's so true. It's like people, when they joke, they sort of say this jokingly like, oh, uh, but they're actually speaking the truth. And you can use that, you know, and it's sort of being a little superpower. You can say like, oh, uh, well, it's an old boys club in here, but here I am, I'm gonna change this up. And you kind of like make a joke and laugh about it. Like, whoa, I see we need more women in here. Like time for some estrogen. You kind of make it into a joke, but you're really saying like, whoa, this is a real boys club and we need to fix this. Mm. <laughs> you know? And the other thing that I think is important is you know, if there's one thing you can take away, it's to have the confidence to speak for yourself and to speak up when something is wrong. Because at the beginning of my career, I think, you know, I was passionate about women in technology and I was passionate about women doing these things. But I felt like if I said something, particularly as I became like, you know, lower level management, I felt like if I saw something and I said something, people would, they would mark me as the feminist. And that would forever be my role. But actually, it is your role. If you think something is wrong, you need to say something. If you think something, you know, that, that's why you get paid. Your, you know, your job is paying you to make the product the best it can be, whatever that product is. 
And so if you see something and you have knowledge that somebody else doesn't, you need to have the confidence to speak up and say that. So, Oh, I love hearing those words. Yes. <laughs> So we had another question. How did you get from there, meaning college, to where you are today? What was that whole journey involving? Yeah, and then so the directions. We love all these, you know, sort of like going off the path and then finding yourself and coming back. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, it's a really good point, right? So I had a degree in computer science. I started up coding. I got into market analysis. And as I was doing that, I became literally physically seated in the marketing department instead of in the computer science department and that's when i saw all of this fun stuff that the marketing team was doing and how much i enjoyed what they were doing and we would sort of do these things like after work i'd be like oh show me how you do that thing and of course at the time it was powerpoint but my apple people will have to cover their ears but um you know how did you do that how did you you know and, and it was the joy was in simplifying the data and simplifying the results of the data and showing things in a fun way and so I started realizing, hey, I really like this part of this role. And so I went back to school at night and I got my MBA. Oh, okay. And so then I had this computer science degree about developing apps and, and developing code and marketing. And lo and behold, now I do developer marketing. So it sort of worked out perfectly. Um, and so, you know, it's like people say you have to look at your life backwards for it to make sense. You know, sometimes going through it, things don't seem to be working right. And maybe a certain job isn't right or a certain thing doesn't seem right or a, a class at school seems difficult. But looking back, you'll learn little things from everything, whether you're good at it or you're not good at it. You know, everything fits into place and eventually you'll, your story will unfold. And it's going to be what it's going to be. At a certain level, you need to work hard and you need to be confident and you need to really think about what's important to you but you also have to kind of let let it go a little bit and know that if you're doing the right thing and you're following your heart and you're working hard and you're trying to listen to yourself it'll it'll happen and your life will will will, will be great you know it's like you know I, i'm really lucky that the people on my team are so so phenomenal but you're what you're doing is five out of seven days of your life, you're going to work, whether you're physically going or you're coming in the home office, you know, it has to be something that you love and it has to be something that drives you and interests you. Um, and you have to really strive to make, to make your life the best it can be for you, which means you're listening to what interests you. That's great. Well, and now we get to your actual job because you just touched on it a little bit and I've got senior director, worldwide developer marketing. What is it that you actually do at Apple? <laughs> well, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, on, on a very high level, basically what we're doing is we are marketing to developers and we're not really marketing to them. Um, but what we're trying to make sure is that Everybody who is a developer for any of the five Apple platforms that we have, whether that's iOS, iPadOS, macOS, tvOS, or watchOS, so all those different things that you play with your phones, your iPads, your watches, your TVs, any of developers that are creating anything for any of those platforms have all the tools, all the technologies, all the documentation they need to understand what, what they need to be doing to be able to create their own apps, to be able to get their apps on the App Store. And so in a very high level, that's what our team is tasked with. Um, and so there's a lot of com components to that. And there's a lot of people that are involved along the way. Um, but at a, at a high level, my teams are in charge of the developer website. So if you any, any of you are interested, all you budding developers, um, developer.apple.com. And you can see there's tens of thousands of pages under that domain um, that my teams are responsible for creating and upkeeping. And then, communications so the communications we we do with our developers in all different vehicles whether that's you know through email or through push notifications or on the web um, we have a communications team and then we have a phenomenal support team so we have 28 million developers who are registered with apple and oh. at any time any of those folks can call in and ask questions and so i have the most crack crazy developer support team you'll ever imagine. These people are so patient and kind. Um, and so that, but those are sort of like the, the big roles of my team. And, and that's not to say I do all these things, that's to say I'm lucky enough to manage the team that does these things. And I think that's really important to remember is that you don't do anything in a vacuum, right? It's, it takes 
a full team of people to, to work together and to, to make all of these things work together. And so, you know, when you're going through school and you're, you have a hard day sometimes, I think it's really important to remember that some of those are the lessons that you learn is how to work with completely different types of people mm-hmm. and how to, how to get along is a really good lesson to learn at school. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, now, I, I should also tell everyone that that um, Esther can only speak so much about her job at Apple, at Apple because of the company policy. But we do have one question. So you uh, decide what's your favorite thing about working at Apple? Can you share that with us? Some more? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I would always start with the people. I mean, we've I've been so lucky in my career to have met some truly phenomenal people. And, you know, that's whether that's my team, my peer team, but also the leadership. So, you know, recently, a couple of years ago, we started a new initiative called Apple Entrepreneur Camp. And it was just an idea. But when I started to formulate the idea and think about, okay, what does this really mean? Who are we trying to help? How are we going to make this work? I basically talked to every female VP at Apple just to get, you know, sort of, we do this thing where we evangelize what we're thinking about to get everyone's input before we go to the big boss and say, we think we should do this. And everyone was supportive. There wasn't one person that said, no, that's too difficult, too hard to, you know, and and those are the times where I feel like this is such a phenomenal company because there's so much support for doing the right thing. And I think it's, it's easy from the outside to, to look at a place and say, oh, they might say this, or they might have an inclusion and diversity website that looks pretty and maybe looks like they're doing the right thing. But when you work for a company and you feel it from the inside out, it's very different. So I think, you know, the fact that, you know, Tim Cook doesn't, doesn't shy away from saying it, like, you know, we should leave the world better than we found it. And, and that there is real, there really is that sense at Apple. So that thing, that's my most exciting. Okay. No, that's great. Now, Zoe wants to know, were there any major setbacks that happened while you were finding your path? Every day. <laughs> I mean, everything is difficult, right? I mean, going to school, trying to find enough money to, to, to figure out how you're going to stay there, how to you know, pay your bills. We didn't have a car. How are we going to walk downhill and get groceries and come back, walk up back up the hill with groceries? I mean, every day was, was difficult. You know, computer science wasn't easy. You know, studying, how to make yourself motivated, being the only woman in the room sometimes. I mean, there's a lot of challenges, a lot of day-to-day challenges. Mm-hmm. But I, I really, truly, honestly believe that if, you, if you're focusing in, in the right way and you always know, you know, not to keep quoting Tim Cook, but he, we talked about this North, this North Star, right? What is your purpose? You, you always find the way, a way to get there. I mean, there are setbacks every day, right? Things don't work the way you're expecting them to. You might have a plan for your eight to five, what you think your day is going to look like, and three things will blow up and you'll have to, you know, change courses. And so you could look at that as a setback, or you could look at that as like, oh, a new opportunity to do something I wasn't expecting to do today. Right. (laughs) And so a lot of it is perspective and how you think about things. Um, But I think the one thing that's really helped me in my career is always thinking about not, not in a self-serving way, but how can we, what kind of opportunities do I have from this, in this role that I'm in right now, whether that's, you know, starting out in your first role or at a senior director level, what can I do that would better the world for other people? And, and I think it's really, you know, it sounds really cliche and it sounds like the kind of thing you should say, but, but really, if you really think about it, that is, that really helps. And it has for me really helped guide, you know, my team's, you know, we really rethought our scholarship program. That was really great. We did a lot of STEM outreach and that was really fun and really great. Always thinking about other people and how you can help others is really, you know, it really helps to sort of like this North Star, you constantly thinking about like, oh, that sucked for me, but oh, I was really able to help this person or I was really able to think through this problem. Then it'll, I think it'll really, it really helps to set you up for, you know, a happy life right this this role that you have to do five out of seven days of your life you've got to make it fun Mm -hmm. that is a wonderful answer now um i'm i'm just reading something we are here with our girl scout troop mostly apple (laughs) and we're being or we're practicing being positive while trying new things excellent what about your thoughts on failure and having female support along the way 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, that is such a perception. And it's not like a problem, but I love hearing that you're working on positivity because everything in your life is about how you look at things, right? You can look at, I look at challenges from my childhood and things that weren't particularly perfect for me. And either those things could have derailed me or I could look at those things and say, these are the things that are going to make me make sure that, that, you know, girls have these opportunities that, um, you know, I'm going to share my life in this other different way. And I'm going to make sure I've, you know, I've done these things and haven't failed in these other ways. And so, you know, trying to pretend that you are perfect or that your life is perfect or this sort of idea that, you know, and, and everyone knows this, this is not an Apple thing. This is an everybody thing. People will talk about work-life balance and, you know, plug your ears, but it's total BS, right? There, there isn't work-life balance. There's, there's work and there's life and they're like this and they're like this, right? Sometimes you have to work really hard and sometimes your personal life will be a failure. You won't cook dinner. You won't make the basketball game. You won't help with homework. You know, it'll be a disaster. But boy, you got that project in on time. It was approved. You know it was good. You did a good thing. Other days, you might be able to leave at 4.30, make a basketball game, buy dinner on the way home. Everyone likes it. And the boss doesn't call you at 8 o'clock. And you can go to bed without doing any extra work. And boy, that's a good day, right? So I think you've got to balance failures with what's positive. And if every day you can look at that and say, okay, this is, this is a balanced day or this, this day sucked, but tomorrow I'm going to have this and I'm going to look at this as a balanced week, then you're going to be in a, a lot better off. And I'm really exceptionally lucky that I've had, not necessarily directly, I haven't had female, in fact, I, I actually now have a female boss for the first time in 28 years. Um, which is which is phenomenal and, and absolutely great. Not that my male bosses weren't great, but it's it's a really fun new change, and I'm loving it. Um, but I've been lucky enough to have really great female support along the way. Whether that's you know my older sister, she was CTO of the British Home Office. She's currently CEO of NHS Digital, which is the national health service in in the UK during this pandemic. So. If I can learn from anyone, I can learn from her, you know, as a hero and, and as a leader, but also, you know, just as a sister. Um, I've been lucky enough to have these sort of mentors my whole life. And I think that is really important. And having mentors is important. Having sponsors is important. But also being that for somebody else is just as important. And you don't have to be at a higher level than the person you're mentoring, right? You can be, you can be, you know, the 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 newest person coming in from college, but I might go to you and say, hey, how do you do this thing in photography? Because I don't know about photography, right? That person's then mentoring me as a, as a photographer. I might not be very good, but that's a terrible example. But, you know, or I might make, you know, scrambled eggs for dinner and I might call my friend and say, please help me. What can I, what else, different thing can I make? That person's then the mentor for me. I'm giving crazy examples, but just that there's, you don't always have to be the boss or at a high level to be the mentor. You know, you're going to learn, no one's good at everything. And so you've got to look for people that can help you with, with different things. And you've got to be willing to help people with different things. And that's where the symbiotic relationship becomes really fun. Well, you just touched on something. We have a, a question from Kirti. Any suggestions to manage family and kids with career? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Help. Um, you know, it's difficult. And I think it goes back to the, to the balance thing. You have to do the best you can do each day and take it one day at a time. You know, I, I personally really been touched by how difficult it has been for some of the parents that I know who are going through COVID right now um, and trying to parent. My kids are 17 and 14, they can do it by themselves. It's, it's not, of course it's a challenge, but it's really not a challenge for me. But for those folks with the, with the little kids, that's very difficult. And I have so much empathy for how that could possibly be that you know, all we can do is, is be as empathetic as we can and try and help each other through that. But you know, the, the idea of balance is that you've got to look long-term, right? There's going to be a, a bad day and a good day. And I think as long as you really understand um, 
I mean, I think, I think humility is really important with, with kids in Korea. I think, you know, right from, from the beginning, I was very clear with my kids. Like if I'm traveling or if I'm staying late for work or I'm working on a presentation on the weekend, to be very clear with them. Hi guys, you know, I'm, I need a few hours in the office. I'm going to be working on this thing, but then we're going to watch a movie. And this is really important because this is my job. And it's really, really important to, to mommy that I do a good job on this mm -hmm. so that we can do well and we can still go on vacation in the summer. You know, <laughs> slightly driving, but um, but you know, but it worked. But but I always felt like that humility helped, you know. And and I don't have young kids now, so I don't by any means mean to say that I know how how impossibly hard it could be for some folks right now. Mm -hmm. um, but just one day at a time, one thing at a time, and ask for help. I mean, really ask for help. Well, now that I w would like to move on, we have one question related to this. But you are a very athletic woman as well and very competitive I understand so can you tell us a little bit about your athletic pursuits and I know um, we talked earlier about the merging of athletics and business of how coaching and being coached and all of those things impact you yeah I, mean, I think it's a really interesting thing because so I, I was a runner um, in school and you know I might have been running away from something, but I was a runner. Um, at the boarding school that I went to, we played lacrosse. And lacrosse is all about cradling a ball in front of your face with a ball that's coming 100 miles an hour in front of you. And I was very vain. and did not want to have my nose broken like a lot of my friends. And so I would do a terrible thing like ducking when the ball would come near me. And so I actually got thrown off the lacrosse team. And the... The punishment was this thing that they called TRB, which was twice around the block. And so you had to leave your boarding school wearing an outfit that wasn't particularly fetching for the time and run around the, the block twice. And the block ended up happening to go past the public school. And so I got really good at running slowly, sprinting, running, running slowly, sprinting past the school and ended up loving running. It's, it's an interesting thing because I, I got into running because I was in trouble and had to run. So that just shows you that you, your life makes sense in reverse, right? Um, and so I loved running. I became a triathlete, a crazy life, lots going on. I love things that are individual sports. You know, some people like the sports that are, you know, team sports. I loved my own world, swimming where I could just worry about my breath, running where I could just let my thoughts go. Um, and so triathlon was really my thing. Um, I went to the World Masters Games for running. Um, I've done a lot of half Ironmans. Um, we haven't done it in the last two years, but the four years before that, we did uh, Cycle Oregon, which is 400 to 500 mile bike rides. Um, and so I, I've loved sports, and sports is a big part of my mental health, you know, just literally. And, and now during COVID, it's been a lot more difficult, but, you know, even just walking outside has been a huge part. But there's also this other part, and I think that's what you're referring to, Lori, when we had chatted a couple weeks ago about the way I look at sports and how important I think sports is is sports can be a, a conduit to business. It can be, you, you, there are so many parallel lessons, right? You're learning how to play as part of a team. You're learning how to deal with setbacks. We talked about setbacks earlier, right? You're learning how to deal with, you know, short-term winnings, but not losing sight of like, oh, I got to win again tomorrow. Like, that I still have to go home and rest. You know, you're, you're learning all these things, but also one of the biggest things I think from sports is this idea of being coached and it really it really helps you in your career if you are not if you don't think you know everything because nobody knows everything but if you can be in that position of thinking of things as being coached and asking how could I do better not tell me if I'm bad or good but how could I have done that better and then you find there's people that are will people are always willing to tell you how you've done better that's another thing I know like people will always tell you what they think <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't listen, there, there are a lot of ways that, that you can get that kind of coaching feedback. And, and it's, it's something that I tell a lot of the, the girls that I mentor to really think about their sports experiences when they're going out for their first job interview. And when they're, you know, when they feel like, you know, they have this resume and it's blank and they, it's like, you know, a temp position or, you know, I worked at sports basement or whatever. They say, but I don't have any experience. And I say, well, then you have to look for the experience that you do have in other places. So write about your experience leading your soccer team. Write about what it was like to, you know, to talk to, to your team when you suffered a terrible defeat in the finals. Talk about what it was like to uplift them at halftime when you needed to rally around. Like, there's a lot of 
there are a lot of parallels in sports that will really help you in your day, you know, in your day to day. Well, uh, Sanvi wants to know, there's so many technology jobs out there. Why Apple? I mean, I think it's, that's to me not a hard question, but maybe not obvious. I think there are a lot of technology jobs. There are a few places and places to work where I feel like they really care about making the world a better place and they really care about the environment and really care about education and not just making money, right? It's not just, a, sure, we do a pretty good job making money, um, but we do it in an ethical way, in a very um, philanthropic way, looking at what's important. One of the things I love, I, I loved about when Tim Cook took over is one of the first things he did on his very first day was he, employed, he instituted employee gift matching, hmm. uh, whereas previously, you know, we gave a lot of money, obviously, um, but it was the corporate decided. And so what employee matching does is it means that if I give money to an organization I like, as long as it's within Benevides, which means it's in our internal tool where it's been validated that, yes, this is an actual, you know, this is legit. I'm not giving myself money or doing anything terrible. Um, that, that then Apple will match that. And I think that really speaks to why Apple cares because they care about you being motivated. That If it's important to you, then it's important to Apple. You know, and that makes a huge difference. I think you feel good about working at a company where they maybe give money to the Red Cross, but if they support what you support, mm -hmm. no matter what that is, mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, that's important. Of course, you know, we're, you know, we have our challenges, but we're a very diverse team. We really think about inclusion and diversity. We really think about bringing your whole self to work. You know, there are a lot of reasons why, I've been at Apple 16 years, there are a lot of reasons why I stay. I think I came for one reason and then because it really has been like that, I've stayed that and the people and, you know, the roles that we've been able to, to, to do and the, the, you know, the new things we've been able to implement along the way. Mm. Well, this has been an absolutely wonderful talk and we're running out of time. I have one more oh, question fast. for you. I think we should end on an, on, on a note that kind of gives our listeners and viewers some real excitement about the future. There's so much happening in technology. By the time some of the people in our audience are in college planning their careers, everything may have changed all over again. What are some yeah. of the most amazing things that you all uh, in your Silicon Valley world are looking at toward the future that could be actually, you know, it intersect in the future. the lives <laughs> of some of our audience? Yeah. I mean, I think, obviously, I can't talk about product or what we're, what we're working on. I think if you look at the industry and about the world in general, I think machine learning and artificial intelligence, whatever way you look at it, I think that's, that's the new frontier that is going to be so exciting when, you know, our, these young girls are at our age and are, are doing stuff. And I think that's what is so interesting about the work that really needs to be done by this generation, that these folks and you, and you sweet girls listening, um, we need you to be the next leaders because machine learning is all about um, the, the, the system learning as it's going and, and learning, but somebody's feeding that, it, that initial set of data. Take, take a, some, a very what's a good, simple example. So is this a dog, right? So now you can, you can use your iPhone and you can take a uh, look at a picture and, and some really smart person has, has created something machine learning to say, is this a dog, right? But someone's taught the computer to say, if it's got two ears that are a little bit pointy and it's got feet, they're in these kind of, and, and someone's, someone initially has put in hundreds of thousands of images of dogs so that the computer can decide, yeah, this is probably a dog, right? It's a very, very basic example. But that's also a really scary thought because somebody is teaching the computer that very first set of what's A and what's B. And so we need to make sure that our female voices and our female perceptions and our you know, female, everything about our, you know, as, as half of the population is represented in that set of data, right? And that's what's so important about inclusion. It's not about women, you know, women's rights and women need to, it's because it's so important that women are treated as equals, right? We, as a, as a society, we need to be really thinking about it. And I think, you know, specifically in machine learning, that is one place where we cannot get it wrong at the start. And we're at the start right now. Wow. <laughs> well, I'm 
crazy inventions that we can look forward to? Not not at Apple, but I mean, just in our technological future. What do we? What do you predict that we we will see, like in maybe ten years? Wow, I wish I could tell you because then I would go <laughs> do it, <laughs> and I would be out of here. Um, I would say. I would ask these girls, let, tell me what's going to be next. These, <laughs> these girls are the smart ones, right? These are the girls that are coming at it with a whole new set of eyes and ears and a whole new world of possibilities and hopefully a whole new sense of self and self-confidence where they're going to look and listen to what they think, you know, and not be constrained with what could be or what shouldn't be, but what they think can happen. Like mm -hmm. the sky should be the limit, right? <laughs> so I, I want to watch these girls grow up and what they do. All right. Well, on that note, we will wrap up this meeting. Esther, it has just been an absolute pleasure to be with you. Um, typically, Michelle, our board member, says a few words at the end. I'm not sure if she's still here. Michelle? <laughs> we have to just turn it back to you for just a few seconds. I just wanted to say to Esther that there are a lot of comments in the chat thanking you from all oh. of the attendees. Um, you are absolutely inspiring and uplifting. And it's so good to hear about the work you've given to the world and also from Apple and to hear that there are good companies out there. there as we hear so many about these bro startups out there and sometimes the toxic culture, but I'm excited for this new generation. And my husband works at Apple, he's on this call and okay. he, he is absolutely pitching to get more of those with uteri um in his engineering departments that he works for so i'll let michelle take and it. they're out there he uh -huh. just needs to hire them <laughs> uh, but sophia he's in the operating system area it's like being a surgeon these are big chop big chop jobs <laughs> they're the people that made the internal mechanisms of apple software work in any event, Esther, so nice to meet you. It's great to meet you. Uh, I started at Apple's software division. I love it. See, good people can move on and do fun things even after Apple. Absolutely. And I ran one of the worldwide developers' symposiums a long time ago. A long ago. time ago. Fun. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, it was quite wonderful. So I'm so glad to meet you and to hear you and to feel all the joy that you bring to what you do. Oh, thank you. It really shows and I think the girls and, and, and parents really have, have felt that. Well, good. I hope so. And I, I'm sorry I can't be with, you know, there's nothing I like more than chatting with, with young girls and, and just seeing their little faces. And, and it's, it's hard to do this when you can't see their little faces, but um, hopefully there are some little parts that they can take away that, that, make, that make this worthwhile for them. Oh, I think so. It opens the world good. Of, of, to things they had never thought of or dreamt of. Okay. So you've been a, quite an inspiration. It always becomes my job to say, we want to engage the parents more and we'd love to invite participation in She Heroes and also donations, because that's what makes the world go round. So if any of the parents are out there and they need some more information, if you work for a tech company and you have a matching program, we'll even take stock. So <laughs> nice whatever it is that can be transacted, we're game for that. We're very 21st century. Did I get it right? Yes, <laughs> still the 21st century. So much has changed in the last three weeks that I haven't quite pulled on to my hat. But we really invite the girls to come back over and over and over, and we invite their parents to participate, and if they can, to reach deep and keep us going. So thank you all. Uh, this was an inspiration. And on that note, I'll take it back from here. Thank you so much, Michelle.
We appreciate that. And I'm going to wish everybody a wonderful evening. Thank you for coming. Thank you again, Esther. It's just been absolutely yeah. wonderful getting all of your insights and, and having you share your story with us. It, it couldn't be more exciting. And thank you to our board for coming and thank you to everyone. So until and thank you to the parents because it's all, it starts with the parents at this age. So um, parents are doing the right thing and parents, if you want to model great behavior, download Swift Playgrounds on your iPad and beat your kids to it.